Praise to you, O Christ, King of eternal glory. Christ humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name that is above every name. Praise to you, O Christ, King of eternal glory. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? Say, The Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it, just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? They replied, The Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I invite you to take your seats. And we're going to think about that gospel reading, that well-known gospel reading for Palm Sunday. It's well known, I suppose, because there is a faintly comical quality to it, a king riding on a donkey. It speaks of humility, of course. But what's interesting, particularly in the way that Luke tells the story of this first Palm Sunday, is the way that Jesus doesn't actually come across all that humble when you get into some of the details. For one thing, Luke is at pains to show us that Jesus orchestrates this moment. No doubt he is thinking of Zechariah chapter 9, where it's prophesied, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. He wants people to think of him as that king. And Luke goes into some detail at how he arranges it all, finds the, sends the disciples ahead, gets them to get hold of that colt, bring it to him. And then it all the scene lays out in those familiar words. But maybe even more strikingly, right at the end of the reading, did you hear it? Jesus did something very, very, very un-English. When people praised him, and when some of the Pharisees say, whoa, they shouldn't be praising you, don't, don't, take, the, don't take the applause if you like. Did you hear what Jesus' reply was? I tell you, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. We're used to people deflecting praise. That's how English people generally respond to people thinking or saying good things about them. Oh, no, it was nothing. Oh, no, it, it was so-and-so who really did all the hard work. Doesn't matter what the truth of the matter is. We always, it's something instinctive to us, say, no, it's someone else. We think it's a bit boastful, a bit braggy for someone to stand there and say, yep, yeah, that was all me. Yep, praise me. And yet Jesus doesn't even say quite that. He goes even further. He says, you haven't even begun to see how worthy I am. When he says, even the stones will cry out. He's basically saying, I am worthy to be praised by every inch of this creation. All the animate ones, of which these human beings here are the highest part, but even the most inanimate object should declare how great I am. If they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. So it is a story of humility, a king riding on a donkey, and yet laced through it from beginning to end, there's Jesus, like I say, being a very un-English, but more than that, whoever we are, taking power, it seems, pointing it all to himself and saying, yeah, this is the way the world is. 
This is the way reality is constituted. I'm the king of all creation. Every atom should praise me. Now, if you think about that for a second, no doubt we find it a little bit discomforting. Perhaps particularly at the moment with all that's going on in Ukraine, we see the devastation that can be wrought by a single individual who has enormous power, particularly if they're not elected or if they're elected in slightly dodgy circumstances. If we're going to have an individual, a king, a monarch, that's the language Jesus is using and drawing on here, the idea of kingship. We all know today the only way that we can have a sovereign, a monarch ruling over us, if they're not elected, is if they're just a figurehead like our Queen. Do you remember during the Scottish independence referendum, David Cameron revealed to us that he had asked the Queen just to raise an eyebrow in support of the Union. And it caused a real stir because we think even though it's just an eyebrow being raised, we cannot have someone unelected wielding any power. The British Constitution is deliberately set up so that the Queen is simply a figurehead. Any hint that she is exercising personal power, we, we go to more and more lengths to remove that possibility. Because we see that if you have someone unelected, or someone who's taken power to themselves, where well, they can't easily be removed by elections, they become a tyrant. That's what power does. We see it tragically in our world, in our own continent at the moment. And yet here is Jesus Christ saying all the authority, not just political authority, authority over every inch of creation is mine. I'm a king. All creation should cry it out. How do we make sense of that? Can we accept Jesus as this kind of king, this kind of un-English king, this powerful king? Let me just give you a few thoughts that might help us from this passage begin to make some sense of it. The first thing is to say, or to at least to ask the question, can we do without this sort of authority? Because when you think about the way that we all live our lives, the way that life is just sort of set up as human beings, you think about it for a second. In fact, all of us have authorities over us that we listen to and that we obey. I'm not just talking about, say, the police or a, a, a regional mayor. In fact, in our politics, it's really important, democratically speaking, that we work hard to make our votes free and uncoerced. But that's not how our own personal lives work. There is a myth that we tell ourselves that all, all our actions in the world are completely free. And they come from me and my decisions in my head, and I act them out. But when you think about the way that we are as human beings, the way that your human heart is sort of set up, that's not quite how it works. You might remember a few weeks ago, we thought about the example of Matt Hancock, the former health secretary, who used as a, a justification for breaking the lockdown rules, which no doubt he wanted to keep, that he was having an affair with his aide. And specifically, he said, you remember, we fell in love. And that's something that was completely outside of my control. And we might scoff at that and say, well, you should have been in more control. But no doubt part of the reason that he used that line at least is because we all know that when you fall in love with someone, you do things that you're slightly not in control of. We might write it off as young love, but in fact, old love is the same. In fact, it's more so. Young love, you can be sort of led to do something a, a bit a bit wild, a bit out there, because you've got a crush on someone. But when, you, when you're married to someone for years and years and years, you've given them authority over you. If they, if, they were, if they were taken away, you'd still have that sense of them. You defer to them. It, it's built into how you live your life. The question is, not so much, 
Shall we have a king over us? The question is, what kind of king will we have? In our own, I'm talking about our own hearts, if you like, our own selves. If you get beyond the, the myth that I'm a completely free actor and no one but me decides how my life will go, when you realise that there are people influencing you, things influencing your decisions everywhere you turn, it's not so much, can we have a king, but what sort of king will we have? And on Palm Sunday, I want to put it to you, that we meet a king for our own lives who is like no other you will come across. Two ways in which that's so that we see in the passage. The first is that he is a king who brings peace. Did you hear the language that the crowd use drawn from that psalm that Peter read part of for us? Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. We're longing for peace, aren't we? Now, today, maybe more than ever, certainly in my lifetime. What that crowd is claiming about Jesus is that he can bring peace in the most all-encompassing way because he gets to the very root of where peace is needed above all else in our human experience. Peace, the crowd say, in heaven. Heaven for these Jewish, belief, Jewish followers here would be the biggest thing they could think of. The Bible often talks about the heavens and the earth, the expanse. But more than that, heaven is the place where God lives. Heaven is the place in the Jewish mind where God dwells in unapproachable light. And so for the crowd to shout out that Jesus is bringing peace in heaven is saying something about the depth, the grandeur, the, the sheer size, if you like, of the peace that he offers. Peace with God himself. For each of our individual hearts, belonging to God, so that we're not at war with him, we're not fighting him, we're not trying to always push him out of our lives because we think he's some tyrant that will harm us and then face the consequences for thinking we can run lives without him. But a life in harmony with his good purposes, his good desires, his good plans for us. And the claim at the heart of Christianity is when you have peace with God, when that vertical relationship is, is healed, is put right again, then throughout every other one of your relationships, if you like, horizontally, peace will begin to come. You'll be made into a peacemaker. You'll be made into someone who works for peace, strives for peace, is able to forgive and bring reconciliation. But it all starts with peace with God, first of all. And that's what Jesus brings in the most extraordinary way. Well, that's at least what the crowd say he's bringing. Can any other king, can any other authority offer this, gra this level of peace. I think I might have read this before in one of our services on a Sunday, but in the wake of the war in Ukraine, I, I came across a story told by a Christian aid worker from Syria. And she was working there with a, a, a small sort of aid organization in the months before the Russians came there to support the Syrian regime in its civil war. And this aid worker and her, her, her friends from America realized we really can't be here when the Russians arrive. It's too, it's too risky. It could kind of, like lots of people have been saying about NATO's involvement in Ukraine, it could inflame a kind of international crisis if the Russians accidentally shoot at us, kill us, and what might happen. So they realized, as painful as it was, we have to get out. And with tears in their eyes, they say good, said goodbye to the small sort of aid project they were working on amidst some Syrian civilians, and they fled for the border. So this lady, the reason I say all that, she is not someone who's kind of naive about the horrors of war. She's not naive about the need to stand up and do what's right, even in situations of, of, of great pain and difficulty. 
But this is what she said, reflecting on, if you like, how you can ever rebuild when a war comes to an end. And her basic point is, as much as we strive to both bring peace in war-torn situations and to work to rebuild societies that have been quite literally bombed to nothing, there is yet a deeper need, even in those situations. And this is how she put it. Jesus and his plan for reconstruction is the only hope powerful enough to survive the ravages of the worst sufferings this age can devise. While mercy relieves and encourages, while bright spots remind us of the goodness of created order and the one who marshals matter, while we are responsible to love our neighbour, we have multiple daily reminders of how fleeting these sweet moments are, how punctuated with sorrow. Yes, we will be right in the midst of development in Syria, bringing health, education and community development resources to those who have been left bereft. But every program is held loosely, knowing that it is human beings, not relief organisations, that will last when the kingdom comes. Infinitely more important than new schools in the suburbs of Damascus are Syrians who are longing for the day of the Lord. The depth of peace that Jesus brings goes far beyond the end of conflict, the rebuilding of nations, as important as those are. And Palm Sunday, if you like, is the announcement that he, and only he, can do that, can bring that depth and wonder of restoration. And that's why he's a king worth bowing the knee to, worth, like these first followers, laying your cloaks on the ground before, symbolically saying, Jesus, you have authority over me. That's the first reason that Jesus is a king worth bowing the knee to. The second reason, though, is this. The way that he brings peace is extraordinarily by giving away his power. And this is where we return to that donkey. <laughs> it might seem a surprise to us that he's riding a donkey. Well, I guess it would have been the first time we read this story if we had ears to hear it, ears to hear the, the comedy of it, a, a baby donkey that Jesus is riding on. And the reason it jars so much is because, well, if we think he has that big a program of making the whole world right again, bringing peace with God, we would expect him that he's going to have to use some force to bring it about. Again, you think of the war in Ukraine, one of the things that feels clear to almost everyone looking in is Putin's not going to be stopped unless a stronger person stands up to him. If you just roll over, you will go and go and go. Because in our world, the only way that you bring about large-scale peace and restoration is someone somewhere has to apply some force. But the wonder of Easter and the thing that that donkey, if you like, points to, the thread that, if you follow the story all the way through Holy Week to Good Friday itself, Jesus pursues that program of peace in heaven seemingly by losing on earth. That little weak donkey, if you like, is of a piece with that pathetic, weak cross on which he dies. I haven't time to go into all the details about how it is so that Jesus can bring peace by losing like that. But as you follow the story this Holy Week, I wonder if you will, you will spot it. You will see the way that Jesus over and over again gives away his power loses out time and time again. If you get the weekly email, you'll have seen Nick spoke about Napoleon Bonaparte and he, comparing him with Zacchaeus, who we meet in Luke's Gospel just a chapter before this one. Napoleon Bonaparte, no doubt, was a man of incredible power 
and authority and force in the world. But during one of his times of exile, he came to talk about religion and particularly about Christianity and Jesus Christ. And listen to what he said. I know men, and I tell you that Jesus Christ is not a man. You might want to quibble with him there, but go on. Superficial minds see a resemblance between Christ and the founders of empires and the gods of other religions. That resemblance does not exist. Christ, having but a few weak disciples, was condemned to death. He died the object of the wrath of the Jewish priests and of the contempt of the nation and abandoned and denied by his own disciples. Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne and myself founded empires. But upon what did we, we, we rest the creations of our genius? Upon force. Jesus Christ alone founded his empire upon love. And at this hour, millions of men would die for him. The story of Easter is the story of Jesus bringing peace where we need it most of all. Peace that will touch every single aspect of this groaning and broken world one day. Beginning with our own hearts, beginning with our relationship with God. But he brings that enormous program in. He brings that a profound, unimaginably good change by giving away power at the first Easter, by dying in our place, as we come to remember and participate in again at Holy Communion. So do you want this kind of king over you? Can your other kings make these promises and deliver on them? Will your other kings die for you? Perhaps this Holy Week in particular, as force and power are so much on our minds, we might see again the wonder, the breathtaking wonder of King Jesus losing for our sake. Well, let's respond to what we've been hearing from God's word. First of all, by declaring together our belief in these truths at the heart of the gospel. I invite you to stand as you're able and take up your order of service to declare our faith in the words of the creed. <clears throat>